Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, the Atom Seminar has the great pleasure of welcoming Professor Yamil Colon. Uh, Professor Yamil Colon obtained his bachelor's degree in chemical engineering at the University of Notre Dame. And then he received his PhD degree at the Northwestern University. Uh, he was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Chicago, uh, where he was involved in the study of material self-assembly. Uh, nowadays, Professor Yamil Colon holds an assistant professor position at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, his research focuses on the study, discovery, and design of porous materials for targeted application. Uh, professor Colon's group use and develop molecular modeling tools to understand fluid behavior in porous confinement, quickly and accurately predict material properties and performance, and study the self-assembly pathways that give rise to promising materials. So once again, welcome Professor, Professor Emil Colon. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, please feel free to start your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Um, thank you to the organizers. Um, really is uh, an honor to, to be able to present um, in, in, in this conference, in um, this, this seminar series. So thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. And thank you again for, for the introduction. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and, and, and jump right into it. First, uh, let me acknowledge um, the people who do the work um, uh, that I'll be presenting about today. So Christian Mukherjee is uh, one of my PhD students. Um, he's been doing some of the absorption and machine learning work that I'll be presenting in my postdoc Senosh. Um, he's been working on um, some of the quantum uh, materials design that uh, work that I'll be presenting. Of course, um, I also have wonderful collaborators um, here at the University of Notre Dame and outside. So Professor Teng Fei Luo, Professor Alexander uh, Dowling, and Professor Felipe Herrera from the University of Santiago de Chile, in particular, who's been uh, helping us out with, with some of the, the quantum materials work. Um, so in, in our group, um, we're really motivated, uh, well, at least one of the motivations for the work that we do is this idea of the fourth industrial revolution. So the first one uh, was steam, water um, in the 1780s, in the 1870s, electricity coming into play in the 1970s with IT, automated production. And now with the increasing involvement and integration of technology into society, civilization, and even into our own bodies, uh, many people believe that we're currently living in the fourth industrial revolution or we're in the cusp um, of, of getting there. And so when we think about this and we start thinking about what does the future hold in, in, in the case of energy, infrastructure, healthcare, the environment, um, it doesn't take very long to realize that the foundation uh, of that fourth industrial revolution would be advanced materials, right? So materials are really the ones that are going to allow us to you know, make the transition away from, from fossil fuels that are going to allow us to do uh, carbon capture you know, direct air carbon capture. They're gonna allow us to capture water directly from air to provide to water in secure areas, right? Uh, materials for advanced uh, drug delivery and diagnostics, right? So then, you know, where are these materials, right? Do they already exist? Maybe we just need to apply them in a new context that we haven't before, or do we need to discover them all together, right? And in, in this scenario, under that paradigm, molecular simulations in particular become particularly powerful. Right. Um, we are able to screen through large materials, we can address performance, and we can then help target synthetic and experimental efforts towards those promising targets, and also get right a, an understanding of what those fundamental landscapes look like. And so with that in mind, I'd like to give sort of an overview of some of the things that we do in my group. So we do some, uh, some work with porous materials, we have great expertise working with them. So we're looking at uh, things like the, the water energy nexus, right? So there's a very tight relationship between, right? How much water you need to produce energy, how much energy you need to produce water. And so understanding um, water behavior and confinement in porous materials, water vapor in particular, adsorption, separations. Um, we have some good efforts on that. Also understanding sort of new hybrid platforms that combine sort of permanent porosity with flexible organic uh, connections that give rise to these hybrid materials that um, have porosity that is subject to polymer dynamics, but others that 
uh, are not. And so we can give rise to really interesting sort of flexible behavior that could be targeted or it could be provoked by certain stimuli. So we're understanding those uh, fundamental material properties. Of course, when you do sort of the type of work that we do in terms of this materials discovery, large scale screening, one of the questions that we always get is, well, how do you know that you can make these materials? Well, understanding the self-assembly um, is a key uh, aspect of that. So this involves then different time scales and length scales from the formation of building units to amorphous, to crystalline, to how these things come together. Um, the self-assembly in particular helps us understand how they're formed, but also um, the morphologies, right? So a, can you make sort of thin films? Can you make large single crystals? Um, large single crystals in particular, we are very interested in, in the case for quantum technologies. In the case of photonic quantum technologies, which I'll be talking a little bit about today, we've, we need large single crystals. And so understanding the, the conditions that will give rise to them um, is important to us. Um, I also uh, have a great collaboration with, with Professor McGinn on looking at ionic liquids for rare earth element separations, um, where we want to understand thermodynamic properties of ionic liquids in the presence of external stimuli, and also bringing in some machine learning um, techniques to help navigate the solvent design space. And also some work that I'll be talking about today, uh, using machine learning to now navigate um, absorption landscapes. Okay, so I've kind of hinted at it a little bit. I'm going to be talking a little bit about metal organic frameworks or MOFs. And so these are nanoporous crystalline materials that are self assembled in solution from inorganic nodes and organic linkers. These nodes, these building blocks, can also be functionalized, right? So now all of a sudden your, your chemical palette really explodes, right? So you have sort of this great opportunity to now be very particular about which nodes you use, which linkers you do, uh, you use, which functionalities you put into your system that will drive then certain interactions that you want with different adsorbates uh, in the system. So that's great from, from our perspective uh, for engineering applications. It, this, this is a, a wonderful materials platform to, to play around with. And so they've been looked at for a great number of applications. Um, things like carbon capture, uh, doing uh, adsorption in liquid water, detection of contaminants, moisture harvesting, uh, refrigeration cycles, drug delivery, things like electronic nose, right? So the idea that you can use someone's breath to detect disease based on the, on the gas molecules that are present. And so the number of materials really has exploded over the past, you know, more, you know, 20, 20 years. You know, if you look at the Cambridge Structural Database, something like so over a hundred thousand structures now are, are available. So this, you know, there really is virtually a limitless number of, of possibilities um, for these structures. Um, and just to give you a sense, right, uh, of the diversity of structures that we have available to us, here's a very, very small subset. So we have something like HQS1, which has a copper paddle wheel and a benzene tricarboxylate linker. So this self-assembles and forms this three-dimensional structure. So you can see this very large pore here, which mostly has some of these benzenes exposed to it. You have this small little cage here, which mostly has this open copper sites available to it. So now you have different chemical environments um, within the, the same type of structure. Um, others like CIF-71, so you see have, you have these very tight windows leading into these very large pores. So you can see how these types of structures could be very useful for things like separation applications. Um, you have MOF-74, which is, these are one-dimensional channels. And they have open metal sites lining the surface um, of, of the structure. So things like catalysis and separations uh, are some, uh, some of the applications that these structures have been looked at in particular. So, Right, this is just a very small subset. You can see sort of the very large um, diversity that we have in terms of, of the material landscape. Now, some of the, the work um, that I did, especially during my PhD working with, with Randy at Northwestern, you know, was, okay, we have so many structures. How, how can we find sort of the best ones for, for a given application? How can, you, how can we characterize sort of these, uh, all these materials in terms of just even their physical properties? And so we developed um that we spent a lot of time developing sort of these high high throughput screening techniques sort of large scale high throughput screening techniques we can now give you a sense of 
what the landscape looks like and can now sort of help you point out what are sort of those promising structures and can lead to, to materials discovery. Now, given this, uh, these types of frameworks, of course, we, we weren't the only ones. There's, there's a large number of groups that also spent a lot of time um, developing these techniques. And thanks to that, there's really been an explosion of data in, in, in this material space. And whenever you hear sort of large data and all that, machine learning starts to play a very important role. In particular for the materials discovery of MOFs, right? Machine learning now allows you to do much faster evaluations, much faster um, a performance. Right. And so you take your structural databases, you take some of the descriptors, which I'm going to get into a little bit. You have your sets. Okay. But really at the heart of this, you need your databases and you need your data sets. And so that's kind of where I'm going to be focusing on today. So the first part of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on how do you generate these databases? Where do they come from? Um, what are the algorithms that you could use for, for generating these in the context of MOFs? And then how do you go about um, generating then these, these data sets. What are some of the new techniques that we can use to now generate large enough data sets to be able to leverage then the machine learning techniques? Okay. So <clears throat> one of the things that I focused on during my PhD was hydrogen storage. Um, and I think this picture uh, really exemplifies sort of the, the, the problem of hydrogen storage, right? So these are hydrogen tanks in different forms. This is the size of the fuel tank that you would need in order to drive the same distance as you would in your normal tank of gas relative to your mid-size vehicle. So hydrogen gas at 200 bar, this is how big your fuel tank would have to be, right? Obviously, you know, just from the picture, we know um, this, this isn't reasonable, right? So we need to find a way to, to densify that. And then of course, I don't, I don't think anybody wants to drive around with 200 bar of hydrogen in, 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 in their car. Okay, so the, the Department of Energy then set out uh, certain uh, storage targets. I believe there's, they, they've been revised, but they're still very similar to, to these numbers that we were working with back then. Um, and in terms of engineering these materials, we really need to think about the deliverable hydrogen or the working capacity of the material. Okay, so um, this is showcased in this figure here. So we have how much gas is absorbed as a function of pressure. If you have a material that interacts very strongly, you're gonna saturate your isotherm very quickly, but some pressure is gonna be left over in the tank. So the actual working capacity or deliverable hydrogen is actually very small compared to a material that doesn't interact quite as strongly, but is still able to get um, large capacity. Okay, so this is something that we need to keep in mind as we think about these materials in, in the energy storage uh, a, a applications. So the way we uh, evaluate these materials is using uh, Grand Canonical Monte Carlo. Grand Canonical stands for the Statistical Mechanics Ensemble, where we fix the chemical potential, volume, and, temper and temperature. And so the number of molecules is allowed to fluctuate. So at these conditions, then we run our simulations. And once we converge, we can extract then the number and that represents then the amount that's absorbed um, at those conditions. Okay, and so even uh, just for, for the models that we're using in, in these types of, of simulations, we, we have found that for the vast majority of cases, um, holding the, the atoms fixed in the crystallographic positions works really well and using uh, generic force field parameters actually also works really well. Um, we treat hydrogen as rigid. We have a Leonard Jones parameter at the center of mass and then we have charges at the nuclei and also at the center of mass, right? To get that, that hydrogen quadrupole. And so even uh, before I joined Randy's group, they've been publishing works on, on hydrogen storage. Here are some simulations compared to experiments for hydrogen absorption uh, isotherm. So the black lines are the experiments and the empty symbols are gonna be the simulations. So one, you know, we, we observe great agreement between the simulations and the experiments. And also each one of these symbols all in represent a separate GCMC simulation where we fix again, the chemical potential volume and temperature. Okay, so this was for uh, for one moth. Okay, the whole idea of this is how do we go about now exploring sort of that large landscape? Well, you have various options. You can go to, to the CSD and you can um, sort of, you know, mine that database for all the structures that are moths. There are some um, cleaning up that you need to do, maybe re remove some solvents, get rid of disorder, those types of things. And so there's, you know, the, there's the core moth database and there are others um, that do that now. That's great. Um, our approach was a little bit different. 
So Chris Wilmer, um, when, when uh, we were together in the group, so he published this work where he took a, what we call a bottom up approach. So you take your building blocks and you sequentially connect them until you form a crystal. Okay, so this, this worked out really well and they were able to publish this, uh, these uh, papers sort of screening through these very large databases. And so we decided to apply then that algorithm with an additional functionalization that is particularly important for hydrogen storage, especially near the conditions that we wanted. We put in a magnesium catechol. And so now we ended up with a, a database of over 18,000 structures that have various degrees of this functionality inside of the MOFs to see how this would affect the hydrogen storage capabilities. So in the end, this was um, sort of our big figure of merit. Here I'm plotting the deliverable gravimetric versus deliverable volumetric hydrogen absorption and coloring in the magnesium density. So very high density of magnesium gives you actually, you know, pretty nice uh, in terms of the deliverable volumetric, maybe not as much in terms of gravimetric and vice versa. Now, if I put this into context in terms of where the DOE would like me to be, that's where they want me to be. Right, so we're still very far away. So even though we did sort of this large scale, high throughput screening, perfect materials, perfect functionalities, we're still very far away. So these types of studies, not only do they give you this um, interesting landscapes for structure property relationships, but they also start uh, giving you different types of questions in terms of some of these targets um, and, and the possibility of these materials to, to meet them. And so at the time we're thinking, okay, maybe we need a different approach as to how we, how we build these, these materials, All right? So before we first built them off. And so there's an underlying net associated with these moths. And so with uh, Professor uh, Diego Gomez, he's now at Colorado School of Mines. It was a postdoc then in the group. Um, we decided to take a different approach. It was like, okay, we're gonna start with the net and we're gonna map then the structure right into it. And so talking about these nets, Right, so if I follow any straight line and I change directions, those points where I change directions, that's a node. And that which connects the nodes are called edges, right? So these nets now we, we think about in, in terms of nodes and edges, All right? So here's a different one. Here's a four connected node. Here's my edge to a three connected edge. So even though I have two, uh, sorry, a three connected node. So even though I have two different types of nodes, the edges are still, the same because they always connect the same types of nodes together. Okay, so these are the, the types of nets that, that we started uh, working with. And so this is what we call a topological based construction. Okay, so the way we went about it was as follows. We can take the nodes, right, that we think about in terms of these mobs, and we can think about just vectors. We can set vectors from the center all the way to the connection points. And we can do then something similar at the, in the nets. And then we simply place, we rotate, and we can repeat this for all the nodes in the nets. We can do a very similar procedure for the edges, establish our connections, and there we have them off. Now, this is a very simple case. When we start thinking about these nodes and edges construction, something else interesting happens when we think about the chemistry. If I follow this straight line, this is a change in, connect in, in direction. So that is now a node. Okay, so now I'm not thinking about it in, in sort of the typical terms of just inorganic nodes and organic linkers, I'm really thinking about just connections of nodes and edges. And these nodes can be inorganic, organic, and so on. So in the TBO net, which is what I showed earlier, this is my three connected node. And so there goes my benzene ring that I showed before. And here I could put in a copper paddle wheel, establish my connections, and I end up with these uh, TBO net structures very similar to, to the H plus one. And so we are really excited about this because now we can do this large scale high throughput screening techniques, look at things like for a surface area versus void fraction, get a sense of the physical properties. Where do the topologies lie? Is there, is there such a thing as topolo topological dependence in terms of, of the structures, right? So each one of these points is now a different structure and I can color in the different topologies to see where in this landscape uh, do they lie. Now, in addition to giving you a sense of what these landscapes look like, they can also, these types of studies can also lead to materials discovery. So here again, I'm plotting deliverable now a volumetric versus gravimetric. And each one of these symbols 
um, is a different structure and I'm coloring in the different topologies. <clears throat> Here I have sort of what you would have in terms of the deliverable, just empty tank. And here's uh, your cryogenic hydrogen gas tank. And so this is, these results are at 77 Kelvin and 100 bar. Now at the time we were really interested in these cyan color uh, structures, this SHE topology. The reason being at the time there was only one structure that we knew of that had that topology. And so it had a six connected zirconium corner, so inorganic and a four connected organic. Through our um, paradigm of nodes and edges, now the identities of these, we can switch them. Now we can have a six connected organic and a four connected inorganic thing into a new structure. Okay, so this structure was uh, not known before. We communicated it to our collaborators. We were able to then go into the lab and actually test it against our predictions, finding a reasonable agreement, right? So these types of studies can not only give you a sense of what the landscape looks like, but it can, they can also lead directly to materials discovery where you first find a structure on the computer and then you go into the lab to try and make it. Okay, so that was an example of uh, how we can use these uh, crystal generation algorithms, whether they're bottom up uh, or, or topological based, and then do quick GCMC calculations to generate these data sets. Now, anyone who's familiar with sort of the machine learning type frameworks you know that a lot of these are very, very data hungry. Okay, so then these leads to other kinds of issues. One is, well, what if your simulations or your experiments are just really, really expensive, right? What, what can you do there? Do you really have access to that data? At that point, you might as well just do all the experiments and, and do your correlations that way. Why, why, why try to do machine learning to begin with? Okay, and so we started thinking about this like, okay, can we leverage the data that we have already produced in some new way? Can we use the data here that we've done for hydrogen, that we've done for methane, to now and try and predict new properties and spaces that we haven't, uh, that maybe the models haven't seen before? Okay. And the other part is, okay, well, what if I don't have those things available to me? Can I be as data efficient as possible to try and develop some of these data sets? Okay, so I'm gonna give you two examples of these. So I'm gonna give you transfer learning and active learning. Okay, so first transfer learning. The inspiration for that was really these types of plots, right? So again, sort of the, this, this is one of the advantages of doing these large scale high throughput screening techniques. All right, so this is hydrogen absorption, volumetric versus gravimetric. And this is methane absorption, volumetric versus gravimetric. The similarities between these are quite striking. If you ask me, you have a very sharp rise you have a kind of a maximum and then you sort of tend towards the, the, empty, ga the, the empty tank limit. Okay? And you see that both in terms of hydrogen and methane. And so that inspired us, okay, can I use this data to make predictions about this data using very limited number of, of points? And so that's where this idea of transfer learning comes in. Okay, so we're gonna do some normal training, right? So we call it our source task. And here are gonna be the descriptors that we're gonna use. We're gonna use descriptors that we think are gonna be important to the absorption process, right? And from the community, we know things like surface area are gonna be important, void fractions, the pore sizes, right? The limiting diameters, the largest diameters. And we're gonna perform then this training on our source sets, which usually can be maybe something that's easy to produce, right? Maybe a cheap experiment, a cheap simulation that you can generate a lot of data for very quickly. And we're gonna take this, we're gonna take what we learn and now try to use it in a new context. And the way we do that is we're gonna fix then all the layers in terms of the weights that we determine in this source task. And we're only going to allow the last layer to change. So when we train now this new machine learning model, we're using everything that we learned from our source task to now only change this very last layer in our target task, okay? The idea being is that now I can dramatically reduce the data burden of, of, of developing these types of models. Okay, so <clears throat> this is kind of the workflow that we follow. So we have our source task. We're going to use all the data that we have. We're going to train it. Then we're going to have a target task where we also have a lot of data available to us. In this case, just to show that we can do this. We're going to take a, a 1,000 random draws, and each one of these is going to have 100 points. And then we're going to use those 100 data points to do the transfer learning and we're gonna compare it against direct learning, right? So the idea is we're gonna go down from you know, 10,000 data points to only 100. 
and we're going to see, okay, is, can, can we do this? Will we, can, can this lead to, to accurate machine learning models? So first we started where we thought we we're going to have a lot of success and that was temperature. My source task is going to be hydrogen absorption at 100 bar and 243K. And then my target task is going to be now 130K. So same pressure, just a different temperature. If I compare then these 1,000 draws in direct learning, direct learning still does very well, but transfer learning, all the draws perform really, really well. Okay, uh, in particular, this graph here on the far right, where we're looking directly at the difference, this transfer learning techniques in most of the cases completely outperforms direct learning. Okay, even though direct learning still performed very well uh, with just 100 data points, but still, right, this shows that indeed you can reduce that data burden on, on your model. So this was just a cross temperature, right? Um, I told you maybe we could use this for different molecules, right? So now we're gonna go from hydrogen to methane. So again, this is my source task. This is my target task. So hydrogen to methane. Now we can see direct learning with just those 100 data points. You know, a lot of these scenarios don't do very well. Transfer learning though does do very well. Okay, and especially here, we can see here the differences transfer learning uh, outperforming direct learning. So here we have a, you know, a clear case where using these transfer learning techniques, where you take your source, um, you go to a target that maybe you don't know as much, can lead to very, very accurate models, decreasing your data burden by, by orders of magnitude. Okay, and then we said, okay, let's get greedy. Let's try to make predictions on something completely different. Can we do from energy storage, can we do separations? So now my source, uh, still the same, but now my target is going to be xenon krypton uh, adsorption uh, to see if we could uh, now predict separation uh, selectivities and, and working capacities and so on. And the answer is no, we can't. Uh, the transfer learning did just as poorly as, as direct learning. Okay, and so then it's like, okay, well, we couldn't. Why is this? Well, we found a limiting case. What, what could be the, the reason behind this? And so the answer is the features. All right, so here's my source task. And here's the relative importance of the features. Surface area is very important, and it's also very important uh, at a different temperature, and it's also going to be very important for methane. When we look at these distributions, then compared to xenon krypton, they're completely different. In fact, you could argue that we don't even have the right features to even just do xenon krypton predictions at all, right? So if your features are not going to overlap with your um, target task, transfer learning is not the way to go. Okay, so then what do you do then in those cases? What do you do when you can't leverage maybe the data that's already out there, all these sort of uh, large scale studies that have been done if, if you're sort of in a new space in, in a new area where you can't do this? So here, uh, I think active learning could be, um, could be a, a way to go. And so let me show you. So usually what we do is we have some training data then we have some supervised learning. So we have some labels associated, we train our model, and then we have sort of these approximated functions for, for the process. <clears throat> in active learning, we have uh, an additional step where now we can request data and come back and retrain. Okay, and so we can be now smart about what data we use in order to develop these models and be as efficient as possible. And the way we do this is with, a, in, at least in our case, is with Gaussian process regression. A Gaussian process is a, a Gaussian distribution over functions where you have a mean vector and a kernel matrix that describes sort of your relationship between the data that you're feeding in. Now, importantly, as an output of these functions, you're gonna get your prediction, but you're also gonna get uncertainties. And so once you get those uncertainties, you can use those to direct this data request. Okay, and, I, I, and that now I, through those predictive uncertainties, you can now start lowering that as you keep requesting more and more data. So this is what we've done, right? So this is sequential design of absorption to other, you know, active learning, adaptive sampling. These are all kind of all, all uh, along the same vein. But now we're going to have as our features, the thermodynamic conditions. We're going to do pressure and temperature. Okay, especially if we think about material performance, a single point at an isotherm, it, it's not going to be enough for necessarily for, um, for process simulations and things like that, where you try to apply them in a different context, you're really gonna need full isotherms. You're really gonna need sort of other temperatures as well. So we're gonna feed in these features and we're gonna have these absorptions. We pre-process the data and then we do our GP fit. Our GP is gonna give us the predicted amount and it's also gonna give us uncertainties. 
We're going to check those uncertainties, see if we're below some threshold. If we are, great, we're done. If we're not, then we're going to sample those points with that high uncertainty. We're going to update, refit, and we're going to keep doing this until we meet the threshold. And so this is something that you can automate um, quite readily with, with, with a bash script if, if you really want. Okay. So let me show you how this works with, with a methane isotherm. So here I have the amount absorbed versus pressure. These black points here are what we call the prior. So these are the first points that we fed in. The red line is the prediction. And here, these, uh, the, the bars represent the predicted uncertainty. So this comes from the model. Okay, so we ask you, okay, where's your maximum uh, relative uncertainty? Okay, it's at the very end. Boom, here's my very next iteration. And now the uncertainties all go way down. We have something that actually looks like an absorption isotherm. Here's my next point. We go, we simulate there, and this is the final uh, predictive, uh, predicted uh, isotherm in red com directly compared with the GCMC simulations in blue. Okay, so we get great agreement with just only five points, three for the prior and two additional iterations. We uh, also do a comparison with the low pressure regime. We also find great agreement. All right, so this was for just one temperature. We also can do this simultaneously in temperature and pressure. So this isn't just a, a GP for each uh, for each isotherm that we put them all together. No, the GP is making it's is navigating this space simultaneously. Okay, and these are the final predictions for methane. We also did it for CO two, going from ten to the minus six bar to three hundred bar for methane, and up to one hundred bar uh, for CO two in the MOF copper BTC, which is the same thing as H one, which I showed before. So again, we show great agreement between these. Um, an important aspect though, to keep in mind, of course, is what do you give the, the model, right? So we, we have these, what we call a boundary prior. So we feed in sort of the, the boundaries of, of the space that we have, and we compare that to a simple linear space in temperature and pressure or the log space in temperature and pressure. And we see the boundary in form captures uh, nicely some of these, uh, the, the rise in some of these isotherms. Though um, when we do it linearly or logarithmically, we see sort of these types of behaviors um, that are not quite accurate, right? So we, at least for, for temperature and pressure, we find the boundary informed priors work really well. Now an important aspect of this uh, active learning procedure is the convergence. So here I have the predicted error for methane for CO2. And here's the real error. So the mean relative error uh, so this is compared directly to the GCMC simulations. So see, these are the number of iterations in active learning. A couple of things to note. One, the predicted error actually corresponds really well with the relative error, right? So we know that in our model, its confidence is actually well justified, right? We see there's a nice correspondence between its convergence and the actual error in the system for both methane and CO2. The other thing to keep in mind is you see here, we only have essentially 30 iterations. This is when the, the active learning ended. Okay, for both methane and CO2. We fit a 50 point prior to this. So with essentially only 80 points, I am able to describe the full temperature pressure absorption landscape from 100 to 300 Kelvin, 10 to the minus six bar and 300 bar or 100 bar depending on methane or CO2. Okay, if you were to just sit down and sort of write a script that submits all these simulations for you and, and so on, you know, you would be close to essentially an order of magnitude more data. Um, in, in terms of the simulations or the experiments that you would have to run. Okay, so this shows, right, how you can now, with this paradigm, develop models um, that are gonna be accurate as they go, and you can be data efficient um, as, as you develop these models, right? So with only 80 points, I'm able to describe this full absorption landscape. Okay, so that's great, right? So now we have different ways where we can leverage the data that's already out there with transfer learning. And if we have some, some new space that we can't do that, we can do active learning to now help us be efficient about how much data we have here. Now, the last part of the talk, I wanna talk about sort of new technologies that are coming out and, and how materials can play a role. Well, we, we need to develop new techniques in order to start feeding in into these data sets. And so that's what I'm gonna be focused on in the case of quantum technologies. So perhaps the one that we're most um, familiar with is quantum computing. Um, so uh, the, the basic uh, or the fundamental unit of that is the qubit. So you have superconducting qubits, which is sort of the, the Google 
uh, quantum computers use. You have like um, ion traps. So you have like things like Honeywell, IonQ, and others. Um, in particular for uh, the superconducting qubits, you need to go down to the millikelvin level to, to get some of these quantum behaviors and, and coherence times that you can do actual stuff with. Um, in the ion traps, uh, last I saw, we were in the single digit Kelvin. Okay, so still very cold temperatures. Estimates put out in, in terms of how many qubits you would need for meaningful quantum computing is about a million qubits. The state of the arts for these are still at less than 100 qubits. All right, so it's still a very large gap in terms of how much is needed, right? And, and of course, I think that the temperatures at which you need to operate here um, are, are a big deal. So in, from that perspective, photonics, um, it can be uh, quite important. So in this case, you can actually get your qubits at room temperature, but usually you have these very sort of large, you know, lab benches. So you need your lasers, your waveguides, your detectors and all that. Um, <clears throat> so then, you know, there, that's where the scalability issues come in. Um, Xanadu published uh, just last year sort of their photonic chip we have this ring resonator where the light comes in. This is where those these entangled states are going to be generated. And then you have sort of the rest of your wave guys and, and your detectors. Now, <clears throat> here's really, um, I would argue, sort of the heart of the system. This is silicon nitride in this ring resonator. This is what produces the, the entangled photons. So this is really a materials problem, right? Uh, there's actually a very few number of materials um, that are capable of nonlinear optics. Um, and we feel that MOFs, given sort of the large chemical landscape, um, can offer sort of new materials platforms and the possibility to actually design the, the, the photon properties. So this is what we set out to do, develop a new multi-scale methodology to address these in, in this context. So <clears throat> one of the issues uh, for MOFs for, for nonlinear optics is that it's very hard to get large single crystals. And so the experimental um, characterizations of these materials usually are done in the powder form. And so now you have interstitial voids, you have crystallized and random orientations. And so that's going to affect sort of the intensity of the signals that you get, where this, they can be potentially misleading when compared to the large single crystal. So molecular modeling in particular can then give, uh, can be particularly powerful to uh, target then synthetic efforts to making large single crystals so materials are good. Okay. <clears throat> if you look in the literature, there's a lot of work uh, for MOFs in terms of what's called second harmonic generation. So two photons come in, one comes out. We're actually interested in the conjugate process. It's called spontaneous parametric down conversion. So one photon comes in, two come out. And so now, right, these, when they come out, they're going to be entangled. And so what I mean by conjugate processes, essentially that means that what's good for SHG is going to be good for SPDC. So things like chiral ligand, large dipoles, D10 metals, and non cetrosymmetric crystals are going to be key in, in, in this process. So this is the setup we, we have in mind. We have a laser. It's going to pump into a birefringent MOF. The, the photons that are going to be down converted and they're going to exit with some correlation in time and then some entangled degrees of freedom. Okay. In order to do this, we're going to do some periodic DFT calculations. We're going to find the Selmayr equations and these uh, second order uh, nonlinear uh, optics to susceptibility term, this chi 2 We're going to combine these to get an effective nonlinearity and use then now these terms into this G2 functions, which then gives us the coincidence correlation. Right, so we're making then a direct connection between the properties of the entangled photons to those of the material. So this is an expression of the G2 function. A lot of this is really related to, to sort of your setup, like the frequencies that you're using, the bandwidth of your detector. Here's where the material properties come in. This L here represents the length of the crystal, which you, you, know, you can sort of set. Um, and then you have this beta sub two here, which is the, the group velocity dispersion. I'm gonna talk a, a little bit more about that. But that's the idea. If photons come in, they traverse through the moth. These photons that are gonna come in with some delay associated with them, and then you have your, your correlation time. And so this full width half max then gives you what that correlation time is, okay? When we look at the Selmayr equations, this is what it looks like. This is an empirical correlation, okay? That relates then the, uh, the refractive index to wavelength. This refractive index we can find uh, to, through the dielectric function, which we can get from DFT. 
and we can get the responses along the ordinary extraordinary axes and then find these perfect face matching angles, which is where that optimal wave mixing is, is found. And we, from the Selmayer equation, we can also find the group velocity dispersions. Okay, so again, making a direct connection between this dielectric, which, which is inherent to the material we can get from DFT, then all the way to, to these properties. Then the next, <clears throat> we also have this other expression. We have this C term here, which is gonna be uh, scaled along these parameters. Here's you have this D effective term, this is effective nonlinearity. Here's a chi two term, and you contract then this tensor um, using the perfect face matching angle that we found from the cell matter equations. All right, so those are then the, the two ways where we make then that direct connection between the materials and the entangled photon properties. So we have then a set of buffs that, that we have that sort of meet some of the criteria that I listed before, our dipoles, non centrosmetric metric. Um, and we're going to do periodic DFT calculations on them using crystal 17. Here are some of the results. So here's my cell matter equations. We have the ordinary and the extraordinary for the different MOFs. We have then the phase matching angles as a function of wavelength, uh, depending if you're positive uniaxial, negative uniaxial, et cetera. All right, so this is work here uh, performed by uh, Ruben Fritz, um, who's at the University of Santiago de Chile uh, and, and Feli Barrera. So <clears throat> we have then... Uh, so there are D-effective terms, the uh, group velocity, and the correlation times then, right? So these are photon properties, and these are the nonlinear optics properties of the material. We were able to uh, validate some of our calculations with BBO and KDP, obtaining good agreement. And we also find that one of the MOFs, MIRO 101, actually has um, similar D-effective, so effective, non uh, effective nonlinearity um, comparable to, to KDP, which is one of the industrial standards. So that's great, right? Um, this now opens the door for us to, to do some, some of these large scale high throughput screening, because now we have a multi-scale methodology to do so and use machine learning to help us navigate these landscapes. So we now like to summarize, right? We, we showed these types of studies can lead directly to, to materials discovery, give us a good sense of what the structure property relationships look like. And thanks to all this data, machine learning is becoming more and more prevalent in the field. And so finding ways to leverage the data that we already have is, is important. And so we show that we can do that using transfer learning techniques. In the case of where we can't do that, active learning is gonna also play an important role where now we can potentially generate not just single data points along an isotherm, but full isotherms and navigate the temperature pressure space. And we expect these types of techniques also to play an important role as we continue our, our search for materials and in, in more uh, sort of a, a new technologies that are coming up. With that, thank you so much for, for your attention. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions. And thank you again for the kind invitation. Professor Iamu Colon, thank you so much for your presentation. We are now open to questions. If you want to participate, please enable your microphone or write it down at the chat and we'll read it. Also, our YouTube viewers can write it down. Let's see if we have any questions from the audience. Let me start. <laughs> Can I start? Sure, go ahead, Professor Frank. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, Wyoming. Uh, very interesting and um, a new results and interesting results. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, you, uh, in your machine learning model, the descriptors that you choose uh, I, I couldn't see any kind of energetic information like uh, the adsorption energy or something like that. Why? Right. So for, I mean, so the, the reason is uh, the, the textual properties, um, so the surface areas and the, the, the pore sizes, these we can get much quicker um, than, than heat of absorption. But, but you're right. So in the case for, for xenon krypton separations, there's work in the literature that precisely uh, points out that you do need energetic based descriptors to be able to make those predictions. In the case for hydrogen and methane, it turns out we don't really need those to, to make accurate predictions. Um, but yeah, so it, that, I think that kind of goes to, depends on, on sort of your molecule. Um, hydrogen, 
you know, for except for very for some exceptions, doesn't care too much about the, the material interactions. It's more about sort of the confining space that that is going to occupy. And then, of course, there's this interactions with the material. But yeah, the, with with just the surface areas and the pore sizes, we, we can do a really good job at predicting those. OK, I understand. Uh, other point is uh, when you try to project uh, the absorption of the materials uh, in in different temperatures, mm -hmm. like you, you get information about one temperature and, and extrapolate for the other temperature. That's very interesting. But uh, in the case of uh, hydrogen, uh, the quantum effect may mm -hmm. depend on uh, temperature. <coughs> That, yes, you're absolutely right. So in the case of, of hydrogen, uh, the way we take uh, those quantum effects into account, we apply a Feynman Hibbs correction, uh, which essentially takes into account the reduced mass. Um, and then so that it essentially is going to depend then on the temperature. And so, yeah, a low temperature, 77K and, and below, those quantum effects are really important. But then as you go higher in temperature, they don't matter as much. So we just include then that term into the force field when, when we do those types of predictions. Okay, it's not only the machine learning, but uh, you add these uh, corrections. Right, Later. so like, exactly. So the, the machine learning is learning from the simulation data that you give it, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of these points are directly from our simulations. And then the, the in this case, the Gaussian process is going to develop a model that fits through that data. And it's gonna tell mm -hmm. you, it's like, oh, okay, I need another simulation here. And so, right, so that's why I say, you know, you're not limited necessarily to simulations. This could also potentially be experiments. Uh, in this case, the machine learning doesn't care necessarily where the data comes from. So you can be as, uh, a, you know, a, as specific or as detailed as you want in terms of the data that you give it. What's really powerful about these procedures is that it's going to be very data efficient. So you can be sure then that whatever data you choose to give your model can be as detailed as, as you want it to be and, and can develop some nice models that's gonna fit through the data. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the questions. Let's see if you have any questions from the audience. Since we don't have any more questions, so- I have one more. Okay, okay, go ahead, professor. No, no, somebody else uh, asked. That's I could ask a question, but this, this isn't going to sound like a grumpy old man question. Um, so one idea, that this mm -hmm. has to do more with uh, just densification of hydrogen mm -hmm. than with uh, machine learning and, and the stuff that you really talked about. Sure. Uh, but, but I've always been a little bit skeptical and, and you must interact with that community. And so I just mm -hmm. wonder what you might say. And, <laughs> I appreciate putting me on the spot. Bring it. <laughs> <laughs> just, you, you know, tell me what people in that community would say back to me. And, and <clears throat> the way it goes is this, the, the dispersion energy of hydrogen is very, very low. To make it stick to itself or anything else is, is difficult. And, and so that's what the problem is. Um, but it's chemical reaction energy is good. You know, if you can chemically bind it with something, it'll stay right there. Um, so what if we had a chemical way of binding the hydrogen and I could get to 99 grams per liter in a very expensive, um, readily available, low pressure liquid form. The name of that molecule is methanol. If you do the calculation, density of liquid methanol gives you 99 grams per liter of H2, because you got four hydrogens makes two H2s. Do the math and you've got 99 grams per liter. So why are people like striving so hard to get this hydrogen up to 60 grams per liter when it's readily available at 100 grams per liter in the form of methanol? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. Um, and then, you know, of course, there's, there's a, a huge also community on, in the metal hydrides 
uh, community that is also looking at essentially, yeah, dissociating hydrogen and putting it in a material um, and then recovering it back. I think, um, so I don't know particularly about methanol, but some of the issues then become about the energetics to recover then the hydrogen back and sort of the reactions that you might get um, when you're, we're trying to get that, yeah, the hydrogen back, potential side reactions and, and temperatures that you might need to get to, to get there. But yeah, there's, when, when we think about sort of the hydrogen storage and, or an energy storage, there's sort of the sort of chemical reaction or, or chemical absorption um, and sort of fizz absorption uh, communities. And, you know, the answer is going to be so somewhere in the middle, but I, 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 right. Uh, the, the concerns are along those lines. It's like temperatures that you need to then get the hydrogen back and potential side reactions that, that could be uh, pernicious to, to whatever system you're operating in. Well, what's the downstream application of the hydrogen? So in this case, is, is cell, v right? in, in, in this case that we were looking at was, was vehicles. Yeah, so um, you're running a fuel cell or an engine. Right, so exactly. Run the engine on methanol. Right, yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. So, so there, I mean, yeah, do, do, you, do you really need hydrogen? Um, a, yeah, I mean, that's, that's certainly a, a potential uh, avenue. Um, I would, yes, I think the, so the Department of Energy does come out with, with a lot of these documents um, where they've, yeah, sort of talked about some of these sort of liquid based storage um, and, you know, methanol is not just the on, only one there, there are others and there's also solid state, um, right? So it's like magnesium hydrides and ammonia borane and others that have a very high hydrogen content in them. It's just about getting the hydrogen back. Those, those seem to be pretty where the concerns lie. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yep, yep, thank you. So um, I cannot see any more questions uh, from neither the audience nor from our YouTube viewers. So our time is almost over. I want to thank everyone for this discussion. And once again, thank you, Professor Yamil Colon for the presentation. Thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you, everybody, for, for the questions. Thank you. So our uh, seminars are being recorded and posted on YouTube. Of course, after the invited electors agreement, please check them out on our YouTube channel. This is our organization committee. We are responsible for inviting and communicating with the lecturers. We also handle social media video editing, certificate rights and hosting. Uh, thank you all for being here today. Uh, we will meet again next Thursday, August 4th, at the seminar that will be given by Professor Mohammed Piri. See you there. <laughs>